<laughs> All right, we're just pushing some buttons, pulling some levers here. We'll get started here in just a minute. <laughs> All right, we're just pushing some buttons, pulling YouTube some levers here. Just came up here, we'll so I think we're good. Just a minute. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> All right, we're just pushing some buttons, YouTube pulling welcome, some levers here. Welcome. Just came up here, um, so I think we're good. Just a minute. Just a minute. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> All right, we're just pushing some buttons, my, pulling welcome, some levers here. Welcome. Just came up here. Uh, All right, well, just, you know, as long as we're sitting here, I might as well address <laughs> right. the elephant in the so, room. I know what some of you are thinking right now. <laughs> Beth, you really look different. All right, we're just pushing some buttons, pulling some levers here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Came up here. Right, well, yeah, Beth, you know, as long as we're out sick here, this month, I might as well. Um, wasn't able to present, so <laughs> I'm right. filling in. Oh. And I've got Mark as always I know pushing some of the buttons in the right background. <laughs> All right. So, without further ado, I say we jump into the slides. All right, welcome. This is the International Game Developers Association. This is the Twin Cities chapter, and this is our game dev meeting. So we're going to go through a few things here at the beginning. This is the intro. That's the part that says, that's this. That's this. We're doing the intro. Welcome to the intro. Um, we'll, we'll do some announcements. We've got a few announcements this month. This month, and uh, and we've got a few. Actually, we've got uh, only one plug, which is me. I think Mark, is that true? We we just have the one, the one thing to plug. All right, and then we've got a, a couple of presentations. Uh, by some miracle, uh, you might notice that what we've got here on this slide is not what I emailed you about because we've had some. Uh, um, had some issues with our speakers, uh, some health, uh, health-related issues, and we've got some uh, some people who have kindly stepped in to help out. Um, so we've got Austin Yarger and Ben Burns, who we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, and then in the, we have a, a post meeting. So um, afterwards, after the meeting is done, you can join join us in Discord and say hi and talk about all of the awesome stuff we learned uh, listening to presentations. Uh, so this is the welcome slide, and uh, this is just uh, here to say that um, um, we want our meetings to be safe and inclusive for everybody, so you're all welcome here. Uh, you don't have to be a member or anything like that. We're glad that you're here, um, and you can find our policy on that uh, on our website. Uh, so this... This meeting, uh, this organization, it's all volunteer run. Uh, so, so the people you see on the slide here, um, these are our current uh, board members. Um, and I'll give a couple of special thanks to some people on here. Uh, big thanks to Beth uh, for helping getting this all together. I know she was feeling sick, but she powered through it and she got us some, um, got us uh, what, got us some people that I think will give us some great, uh, some great talks today. So I'm really excited. So thanks to Beth, um, and thanks as always to Mark for pushing the buttons in the background. It's uh, really nice to be able to hand some of that off, Mark. Because <laughs> if I was trying to do it all, I'm not sure it would get done. And, uh, and of course, all of our uh, volunteers and board members that help get, keep this uh, thing running, uh, big thanks. So this is the game dev meeting, like I, I, I said earlier, uh, and that takes place on the second Wednesday of every month. We've got two other meetings um, uh, each month, uh, usually. Um, 
We've got the Twin Cities Playtest, which is the third Wednesday, and we've got the uh, MNVR and HCI meeting uh, that's usually on the fourth Wednesday of the month. Uh, Mark, did you want to say anything about the playtest? Anything to say about that? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, if you have a prototype to play, um, they would. I'm sure they'd love to see it. So get in contact with those guys. That's awesome. Uh, and then the Minnesota VR and HDI um, group normally meets on the uh, the fourth Wednesday of the month. And I think they're actually going to have, I think uh, Zach is planning on having a, a meeting this month. Is that right, Mark? Yeah, that should be cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. All right. Uh, so uh, membership is not required for, for any of our meetings, but if you um, are a game developer or an aspiring game developer, uh, this is a good organization to be in. And, uh, and we're just a one piece of a much larger network of, of uh, game development organizations. Uh, you can learn more about that at igda.org. Okay, news, plugs, slash announcements. Okay, so <laughs> I've got something exciting to talk about. I launched a new YouTube channel. Uh, Mark, did you happen to, to see this uh, To see this channel, uh, see what I posted? No, I just heard you had something cool to, to share. I hadn't seen it yet. Okay, all right, this will be new for you too then. Um, so I'm going to exit out of my slide and go over. All i got to show off is uh, you go to the, the web... Uh, the web URL, uh, don't make MMO dot games. That's my new, my new brand. Uh, you'll find a link to uh, my YouTube there. Um, hopefully somebody will be kind enough to drop this in chat for me. I've got a brand new video where I will be doing some devlogs on making an MMO. It's my personal project. It's mostly just for fun. Um, I just miss being able to talk about my personal projects with my friends. Um, you know, kicking around at the office and stuff like that. And so this is kind of my way of just uh, getting some of the things that I do out in front of people. So, yeah, please do check that out and let me know what you think. All right. Back to the slideshow. I think that's and OK. Oh, yes. Hey, did anyone notice there's something different about the slides? They're much, much more prettier than they used to be. Uh, Mark, would you like to talk about uh, what has happened? Yeah, so we've struggled for quite a while on branding for the chapter. Uh, n really, the only reason is because it's very hard to brand an IDGA chapter because uh, you sort of have to incorporate the parent organization's uh, identity with our own. But also, we talked a lot about we didn't want it to be so specifically video games. Uh, we wanted to include board games, and we wanted to have it represent uh, our locality, but not be so specifically tied to a landmark. And it was a challenge. And we did a lot of iteration. And we ended up with this, which is it's sort of a twin stars for the Twin Cities. And then you know using the IDGA parent uh, color scheme, which was a challenge to begin with, but adding that splash of blue to represent the land of 10,000 lakes. So I feel it's pretty good. It has a kind of a, a, a um, aspirational aesthetic to it. And it's not too. You know, it's not buttons and D-pads, which is something that, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but we, we wanted to try something different. And it took a little while to get to it, but um, the board kind of threw in about, like, this is what we want it to say and do. And I, you know, went back and did some prototypes, some iterations, and we landed, landed here. Well, it turned out great. Thank you so much for your work on that, Mark. That's really, Thank you. It's, it really turned out well, and I'm excited to, to go forward underneath the new banner. Okay, so, uh, ah, Global Game Jam. Do we have any Global Game Jammers in our crowd? I, I know we do. I hope so. Um, yeah, so I think, I think I'm going to do it this year, Mark. Uh, yeah? I think, I think I'm going to make a game. I didn't, I didn't last year because I had uh, twins who were, uh, let's see how old, well, they were, they would have been one in four months. Uh, 
it's a, it's a fair excuse, I'd say. <laughs> I I just felt I just. I just would have have felt terrible leaving my wife for even a weekend to go. Yeah, away. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's coming up at January twenty eighth to the thirtieth. Um, our plans were to do this in person, but uh, you know the the uh, the way things are now. Uh, ah, Omicron. <laughs> um, you know that's just the way it's going to be. <laughs> So yeah. we've partnered. We've partnered with Amber Waves of, of Games, which uh, is another. Uh, I mean, I think they're. I mean, they're sort of primarily a game jam group, right? Is that is that a fair way to characterize them? I think so. And now we're we're you and I are a bit disadvantaged trying to explain this because Nick from Amber Waves was going to be our speaker tonight um, and talk a little bit more about um, what that they do as an organization. But uh, they have a Discord that is um, represents developers from the whole Midwest, and um, uh, we did it online last year. And we thought we wanted to maybe give people more access to more people doing in a similar situation, especially because our original plans sort of fell through. We want to be a little bit more tightly uh, uh, partnered with these folks. So uh, details to come. Um, but basically, that's the weekend. We're going to be doing it on Discord again this year. And um, that URL there uh, will eventually link to the Global Game Jam uh, site on the Global Game Jam website. It, I just set up that shortcut, so it's not working quite yet. It gives DNS time to refresh. But then you, you can you can sign up for the um, for the site, um, and uh, and yeah, it will have just as it is every year, but just or really just as it was last year, um, online. Yeah, very cool. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm being I'm sort of just mumbling through because we don't have um, every little bit of detail, but there's not much to know right now. If you, you know, that's yeah. the weekend, that's the important thing. The exact uh, details on like how we're going to be doing like office hours, we're going to have the board members are going to uh, be available to help coordinate teams and answer questions and, you know, troubleshoot the website and all that stuff. And we'll have some details on how that works. Um, maybe last minute, but maybe that's all we need. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's kind of what we need to say for now. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. So that out of the way, um, if I don't, I don't know, yeah, I don't know if we ever get anybody who actually takes us up on this, but if, if you have something you'd like to plug, uh, at one of these meetings, uh, let us know if you have something now and you, um, wanted to jump into discord, we could probably accommodate that. Um, but in general, if you have anything to show whatsoever, we would be glad to have you up on the stage and talk about what it is that you're working on, be it, uh, you know, a new YouTube channel and some, uh, some dumb videos about MMOs or anything else. <laughs> David, you got to make sure to, um, next month, I, I want, uh, just a quick update during the meeting. Um, takes, take five minutes next month to say what, what, what step two is. Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, I got I got stuff in the pipe. It'll be fun. Um, it's it's kind of just the you know it's gonna be a channel you know it's gonna be me talking about just like the stuff that I like thinking about and you know not really uh, not really much else and and who knows if if anyone w likes watching that kind of thing but you know we'll see. <laughs> All right, so next up is our presentations. So I need to get over to OK, so we've got a couple of presentations today. And uh, the first one, uh, this is someone who I just met today. So uh, this will be this will be interesting. Um, uh, this is, uh, hello, Austin, are you here? Hello, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, welcome. Welcome to the meeting. We're here. <laughs> okay, uh, let me get my camera turned on. Here we go. Doo -doo -doo. Hello, can you see me? Yeah, okay. I can see you. Fantastic. All right, uh, so let me go ahead and get my slideshow up really quickly. Uh, this will be... 
a you know, 45 minute to you know hopefully not quite 60 minute presentation on the topic of um, games on modding and hacking. In fact, we'll be doing two live hacks. Hopefully they go well and uh, it should be a pretty good time. Uh, so let's go ahead and get that slideshow rolling. I'll show you my screen here. Grab the right one. Da, 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 da. Here we go. Oh, oh. All right. Okay. Let me let me know when we're ready to rock. It's all you. All right. Fantastic. So everyone, if you want to follow along uh, on your own, or if you want to find these slides after the show, uh, you can always find them at yarger.dev. Okay. So let's go ahead and get to it. Well, you know what? I'll be honest. I've already lectured a few times today. So. And hacking is so hard. Like, let's let's do something else, okay? I want to reminisce a little bit with you, okay? All right, who is a fan of Skyrim? Anyone in the chat a fan of Skyrim? Play the game. It has that classic opening, that opening that's been memed a few times. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and reminisce a little bit. I want to watch that opening. It's so cool. Let's uh, let's give it a watch and just remember the good old days. You can hear it, correct? You started this war, plunged Skyrim into chaos, and now the Empire is going to put you down and restore the peace. What was it? It's nothing. Carry on. Yes, General Tullius. Give them their last rites. As we commend your souls to Aetherius, Blessings of the eight divines upon For the love of Talos, shut up and let's get this over. Of as you wish. Come on! I haven't got all morning. My ancestors are smiling at me, Imperials. And you say the same. Trigger warning. Sorry. Justice. Death to the stormcloaks. As fearless in death as he was in life. Next, the Nord and the Rag. There it is again. Did you hear that? I said next prisoner. To the block, prisoner. Nice and easy. All right, you know, I feel like something was slightly off. I don't quite remember Thomas playing such a big role in this game back in the day, but you know what? He's a really cool guy, uh, and so let's uh, let's be happy for him. Um, you know what? I like Skyrim, but what I've been playing lately is a lot of Resident Evil 2. Has anyone played this game? A fantastic, fantastic mix of old-school survival horror and puzzles uh, and uh, modern combat. Extremely cool game. Let's uh, let's go ahead and take a look. Let's reminisce a little bit. Oh, 
You know, I'll be honest with you, I, I guess I didn't play that part. You remember the part where Thomas busts through the wall and, and chases you? I, I, don't, I don't personally remember it. You know what? Let's play a real classic, uh, a game that sold a bajillion copies that so many people have played on a very popular console. I'm talking, of course, about Mario Kart, right? Has anyone in the chat played Mario Kart? All right. Let's, uh, let's, let's check out one of my favorite courses. I just really, um, yeah, I just really, uh, really like, uh-oh. Spoiler. You know, it, it really does warm the heart to see all of the jobs uh, that Thomas has picked up since his earlier career in showbiz ended. Um, Thomas has become something of a mascot for the modding community, uh, the hacking community. Um, one of the first things that you will do when a new game hits PC is you will find a way to get Thomas the Tank Engine embedded in it somehow. Uh, and uh, he, as a result, uh, has started to take on a life of his own. And it's, it's just a really, really fun thing. Um, people have definitely been sued over this. Uh, fortunately, I, 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 I um, met the man who um, created the Skyrim uh, mod uh, at um, M Plus Dev. Uh, he currently works for Raven Software. And regrettably, he was actually sued, I believe, by Mattel. Uh, and it was a little bit scary for a while. Uh, but a, a very, very cool effort. Uh, the amount of work that modders and hackers put in to bring our games back to life is just incredible. Um, but of course, yes, right? Thomas means many things these days, uh, many more than maybe he initially did. Um, my name is Austin Yarger. I'm a lecturer at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, I teach the main game development courses there. I'm also the president of Arbor Interactive, which is an educational game studio uh, based in the same location. I worked on The Sims 4. I worked at Electronic Arts Mobile for a little bit and at Facebook for a little bit. I currently teach at U of M. I wrote some very basic simulations as a grad student for DARPA. Uh, I have worked with uh, orgs like Girl Scout Coders, uh, Wayne State University. We did some research work for them. Uh, and I currently run the Ann Arbor chapter of the IGDA. Uh, we represent um, most of Metro Detroit uh, and uh, most of the state. Um, IGDA Ann Arbor is a pretty fun organization. Uh, all of you are welcome to join us for various events and game jams and, and whatever you like. Uh, you're all welcome there anytime. We have monthly meetups. Uh, we have show and tells where you can get feedback anytime. You can do it remotely or in person. Oh, it's, a, it's a bit of a drive from Minneapolis and, and um, St. Paul, isn't it? Um, so you can say hi on the Discord server if you want to, and you can check out our upcoming events at any time. Uh, this upcoming week, we have, sorry, on the 27th, we have Shell Games. Uh, Nico Williams, a producer at Shell Games, uh, is going to um, uh, kind of walk us through uh, how game production works at Shell, how project management works. Shell is a really cool company. They're often in the background of very, very popular titles and franchises. Uh, they work on Star Wars titles. Uh, they work on virtual reality titles uh, like I Expect You to Die, the cool kind of James Bond thriller set in VR. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll learn a lot. They're constantly working on a ton of projects, and it, uh, it'll be a good time. Our mission today, in the next 45 minutes or so, is I want to take you through some of the history of cheat devices, cheat codes, and hacking. Uh, it's going to be fairly brief, but should be fairly fun. I then want to hack two games live with you. Now, these aren't going to be super deep hacks, and it's going to use a you know a fairly accessible tool to help us out. Um, however, hopefully it'll spark some of your own interest. 
uh, so that you can take these awesome games you love to play and learn a little bit more about how they work. You know, where are certain values stored in memory? Um, and, uh, you know, maybe maybe you spark your interest in, in doing that kind of stuff. And then I want to talk very briefly about what the future of hacking and modding could hold, you know, in a world where the streaming paradigm takes off. And that's no guarantee, but if it does, you know, how are we going to mod games? How are we going to hack our games if our games are never actually hitting our laptops, uh, if it is just images coming to our machines and our screens and not the actual binary code? Okay, so let's go ahead and roll. 1986 uh, was a pretty cool year. It was the end of the video game crash uh, of uh, 1983, and it ended in large part because Nintendo brought Legend of Zelda, uh, Super Mario Brothers, and, Super and uh, Metroid, uh, along with the NES, to the Western market. So 1986 saw the release of the NES in North America, but compared to the Atari, games were really revolutionary, and uh, a great deal of them are still uh, studied and, and appreciated today. Um, I can't say quite the same for Atari, though it certainly has its fans. Games in this era were extremely challenging. And ask yourself why. Does a designer set up off to make a super, super challenging game just because? Uh, to make it more satisfying? Well, that might be a part of it. But back in the day, Best Buy, or sorry, Blockbuster. Blockbuster was the real killer. Uh, Blockbuster was a big problem for the business model of most game developers and publishers. In Japan, Blockbuster, the kind of stuff they did where they would buy one copy of the game and then rent it out to many people was illegal. And so if you look back at many of these games, the Japanese versions of the games are actually a bit easier. Now in North America, Blockbuster and its activities was not illegal. And so you know, if Blockbuster bought one copy of your game and then rented it out to a thousand people, you were in trouble. Right? Because Blockbuster was taking all that value and you weren't getting that for all your work. And you, know, you need that value to keep making games and keep expanding. So how do you defeat that? Well, what developers chose to do was they made their games very, very hard. Right? They had to make the experience longer so that it wouldn't be worth just renting and renting and renting. You'd want to buy instead. But during this era, it was very hard to make a lot of content. There were storage limits and the tools just, it was hard to make content in general. Uh, and so uh, how do you make a game longer without making more content? Well, you make that content harder, right? So that you need to demonstrate mastery, absolute mastery, in order to see the next small bit of it, okay? And so that's how it went. We had a really, really tough games, and they were awesome. People loved to play them, but boy, was it tough, right? In 1987, Konami came out with a real awesome you know, killer app, Contra, right? One of the classic run-and-gun 2D side-scrolling shoot-'em-ups. Uh, had fantastic co-op gameplay, beautiful graphics, a great soundtrack, and oh my goodness, was it hard, right? Contra came out, and it was beloved, but it was brutally hard, okay? Players discovered, however, eventually that there was a sequence of inputs in the main menu that could give you 30 lives instead of just three, and that was a big, big deal. Um, uh, players discovered this code and the, the fact that it actually worked in other Konami games as well. As a result of this, it became known popularly as the Konami code. And the Konami code really made an impression. I mean, it was critical. It was the difference between defeat and victory for so many games, for so many players. And the AVGN actually had something fairly interesting on this topic. Uh, let's see if we can um, uh, get, uh, get a word from uh, James Rolfe here real quick. To beat a game back then was kind of a big deal at the time. You know, uh, you didn't always beat every game you owned, and some you were more skilled at than others. And I never considered myself that skilled in general. Um, I always felt like the other kids were usually better at things than me. Like, you know, I was never good at sports or anything like that. I always had a really low self-esteem. But I realized something, that whenever... Uh, Kids would come over and they'd play Contra with me. You know, they'd come over like, hey, you want to play some Nintendo? Yeah, what game? How about Contra? Yeah, let's play Contra. And you start it up, I'd hit the start button, and then they'd be like, wait, 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 wait. Hit the reset, and then I'm like, what? And they say, you forgot to put in the code. I'm like, oh, the code? Oh, there's a way to cheat with this game, huh? And that was uh, a big way uh, for, you know, that was just kind of a a typical approach to playing many of these very, very hard games. Um, and, uh, and so it kind of entered the culture. It entered the culture so much that now that 
uh, many people who grew up with this are older and have a lot of money to spend, uh, various brands and uh, pieces of media and art are catering to that. So Wreck-It Ralph is a fun example. Uh, King Candy, in order to break into the game's code and, uh, well, cheat the main characters, uh, enters the Konami code, especially without calling it out. That's a really cool touch. Um, Google Stadia, uh, when it was first um, uh, announced, uh, Google is not necessarily known as a big gaming company, and they really wanted to prove their chops. Like, we're a game studio, fam. Uh, and they did this by uh, putting the Konami code on the back of their um, controller. Now, I bought one of these controllers, and it is not there. Uh, so they ended up removing it. So you know, there you go. Uh, they also, like... They're also in a bit of a tailspin right now, but that's not that's not on topic. I wish them the best of luck, though. Um, unfortunately, the creator of the Konami Code recently, well, semi-recently, passed away. Right? It was uh, Kazuhisa Hashimoto, um, and uh, and uh, it's it's you know it's it's a, a big loss for the industry. Uh, definitely a legend. Um, now, what's what's really interesting is that players started to discover codes in non-Konami games. Um, and essentially what would happen with these codes is that the games would need to be super tough. But at the same time, there's a tension there because the quality assurance team needs to be able to play the games. And so if the games are super tough, the QA team can't quickly get through the game, uh, which means they can't test very efficiently, and that's bad. So these codes you know, get put in the game, and sometimes they get left in accidentally and sometimes on purpose. But players in 1987 began to discover that there were codes in non-Konami games as well. And what's more interesting is that not every code was meant for cheating, just getting more lives or getting infinite health or something like that. Many of the codes, well, uh, some of the codes actually gave you cool new content in the game, right? Um, in The Legend of Zelda, if you happen to put your name in as Zelda, I imagine a ton of people did that, thinking that was the main character's name. It would actually start you not on the normal adventure, but on the second adventure, a more difficult master quest version of the game. Um, in Metroid, uh, if you entered the famous Justin Bailey code, you would actually start the game with a different costume uh, for Samus, uh, the main character. And so it was a really, really uh, cool uh, time to be looking for codes. In fact, people were so obsessed with finding these codes that magazines, entire magazines started to come out to give you these codes. Nintendo Power, does anyone remember these? Nintendo Power, Code Vault, Tips and Tricks. I had the, a ton of this last one. And I would just read through codes for games I didn't even have. Uh, it was that much fun. Um, but the problem here was that not every game had codes, you know? Uh, but people still wanted to, to get codes to these games they love that are maybe too hard, or they just want new content or a new way to experience the game. So what are we going to do? Right? How can we make new cheat codes for games that are already out? Well, in 1990, a company called Codemasters which might sound familiar, uh, came up with a solution called the Game Genie. Right? The Game Genie looked like this. I always uh, think this kind of looks like underwear, like whitey tighties or something. Um, it's very strange. Essentially, the Game Genie is this golden part and is plugged in to the end of the cartridge that would normally go facing into the NES console. This uh, kind of band back here is to keep it hooked in to the cartridge and secure. Okay? It was created by Codemasters in the UK. They are now famous for the uh, Dirt series of racing games, and they were recently purchased by Electronic Arts. I've often wondered how the relationship between Codemasters and Nintendo would go these days. I don't believe they usually release games for Nintendo platforms, but I wonder if Nintendo holds a grudge. Anyway, um, uh, there are technical notes uh, down here at the bottom here, uh, if you'd like to read more about exactly how it works. But the insertion process looks like this. Okay, You put the Game Genie on one end, and then you jam the Game Genie into the cartridge, and it kind of sticks out the end. It doesn't look great, but it works. Okay. And the question is, well, it works, but, but how did it work? Right. Well, here is an example of how it works. I have a friendly exchange for you. Okay. Let's say you've got your phone here, and one day... You know, you, so you've got a, f a phone here and you've got your friend named Alice. Now, one day you get a message on that phone and it says something like this. Hey, friends, it's Alice. I just got a new number. OK, and it's coming from unknown, but it's Alice. Right. So, OK, I'll plug her new number into the uh, phone the contacts. OK, so now it's Alice. Good. All right. It's Alice. 
Now, over the next few months, your relationship with Alice grows and you start to share some pretty personal stuff, stuff you wouldn't really want getting out, okay? That's uh, something you'll have to be careful with. Now, what is actually happening? Well, you know, let's say this is you here and this is Alice, let's say. Now, you think you have a secure encrypted, well, at least a secure, at least a semi-private connection between the two of you for your communications, right? And you are sending stuff to Alice, and Alice is responding, right? Uh, you talk later, and those conversations are actually happening. However, this isn't exactly what is happening, because under the hood, what's happening is this. You have a secure session with someone, and Alice has a secure session with someone but not necessarily each other. There's a man in the middle, and it's Corbin Reeves, my colleague at Eastern Michigan University. He helps me run IGDA Ann Arbor. And now he knows what your favorite anime is. You're in trouble, big trouble, okay? And so you have just been man in the middle, okay? It's a man in the middle attack. And this is a big, big, big topic when it comes to computer security, okay? If you've taken any secu uh, security classes, you almost certainly have heard of this. Uh, if you have used the internet very long, you almost certainly have seen a screen like this, okay? An SSL error. What this is trying to do, what this is, is your browser is trying to warn you that you might be getting man in the middle to right now, right? We're not sure. Maybe we can't verify that you're not getting man in the middle, okay? Um, and on occasion, you see something in the news. You know, UC browser for Android desktop exposes 500 million users to a man-in-the-middle attack. You know, this is a big deal, and it, it, it strikes all the time, okay? Very hard attack to defeat. However, what we have with the game genie is a genie-in-the-middle attack, okay? If you look here, the NES cartridge is right here on the side, right uh, toward the top of the screen, and the genie is actually positioned between the cartridge and the NES game hardware, okay? And so all NES game pack communications have to go through this genie device. And that means that we have a genie in the middle. The genie relays all of the signals and communication between the pack and the hardware. But that's a very powerful position to be in because the genie can control and mess with these communications if it wants to. All right. Here's an example of what it can do. OK, here's the NES hardware. Here's the genie. And here is the game pack. When the game boots up, the hardware might ask a question of the game pack. For instance, it might try and look up where Mario starts in this particular stage. What's the X and Y location? Now, this signal will go through the game genie and be unedited, unaltered. OK, the game pack responds and the response goes back to the hardware. So, so far, so good, just like normal. OK. It might ask, you know, what sprite do I use for the clouds? And the game pack will tell it to just recolor a bush. Okay, all normal. Now, if the hardware ever asks a question like, hey, game pack, how many lives does Mario start with? The game genie might jump in and respond, definitely a thousand. All right, definitely a ton. And the thing is, the hardware, the NES hardware actually has no idea that this response isn't coming from the game pack. It thinks it's coming from the game pack. In fact, the genie is programmed to intercept that request and return a desired value. This creates a cheat code uh, that didn't exist on the game pack, okay? And so it's a pretty, pretty, cool, pretty cool time. So the question never actually reaches the actual game pack. The NES is none the wiser. This is a man in the middle attack and allows for more or less complete control of the entire experience, which is pretty darn cool. So the Game Genie was really popular, and so competition started to appear for other consoles. If you haven't heard of Game Genie, you might have heard of Game Shark. Right? Has anyone heard of Game Shark? I had a couple of these back in the day. Very cool devices. And what you'll notice is that it doesn't matter what hardware or what console the Game Shark is for. It all works the exact same way as the Game Genie, right? You have a it has to be positioned between the console hardware and the actual game pack itself. And this is just terrifying. Look at this tower of, of uh, cartridges. Ooh. Now here's the Game Boy Advance version that I had. Uh, so you'd, uh, you'd stick the, the, the short end into the back of your Game Boy Advance, and then you'd stick the cartridge on the tall end. All right, you got Action Replay for the DS, the DSi, right? However, we've just talked about consoles for the most part. On PCs, things were getting pretty interesting, OK? So let's talk a little bit about modding on PCs, okay? 
Well, if you think about a game, you know, I spend a lot of time just thinking about games as a piece of entertainment. It's just a piece of art. I click a few buttons and it runs. But really, you know, a game is just a piece of software. It's just a list of instructions that are running on your processor. It's stored in your RAM, okay? And you own all of this. You can control it. And that's something that we don't think about very often, do we? When you load a PC game, when you download it, put it on your disk, put it into your RAM, it goes in. And you can edit it if you want to, right? So we got this game coming from Steam, Resident Evil 2, and it goes into our uh, RAM and it's starting to execute, okay? And note, remember, you own your RAM, so you can control it. You can control your memory, just like the Game Genie controlled the NES. The problem for us, though, is that when we look into our RAM, all we're going to see are a bunch of numbers that seemingly make no sense, okay? The game's running in here somewhere is the number of bullets that Leon is holding. You know, in here somewhere is Claire's health bar. And if only we knew which ones and zeros to alter, we could change our health value at any time. Okay? Um, and so, you know, this right here, you know, this byte right here could be the health, but we don't know. It could also be over here. It's just, it's, it's hard. How are we going to manipulate this? How are we even going to begin to figure out where our important values are so we can mess with them? Well, we begin with really good tools, okay? Really good tools. Tools like uh, the BGB emulator, okay, which we'll be using in just a sec, right? That is a Game Boy emulator. Um, and Cheat Engine. Has anyone heard of Cheat Engine before? It's a fairly popular um, uh, tool these days, uh, not just for, you know, uh, experimenting with uh, games that you buy, uh, but also uh, for, you know, looking into how other programs work. I remember... I had written like an essay in Firefox and uh, the website I had been writing into like just spontaneously decided to like reload and that caused my essay to go, you know, go bye-bye. It was gone. I didn't copy paste it to clipboard. I just lost my essay. So what I did was I opened up Cheat Engine. I attached to the Firefox process. I dumped its RAM and I was able to find my essay was still in RAM. So I was able to cover, recover my entire essay even though it wasn't on the screen anymore, uh, by looking into the RAM and finding where it was still, uh, still existing, right? So anyway, um, you can use it for all sorts of cool stuff. <clears throat> anyway, what I'd like to do now uh, is I would like to show you a couple hacks, okay? One is much easier than the other. Um, I want to show you a hack of uh, one of my uh, childhood games, Looney Tunes, Carrot Crazy, okay? For the Game Boy Color. Now, the Game Boy Color only had about two kilobytes of RAM. This was 1999. And so that's pretty nice. Uh, that is a lot of addresses and a lot of locations. Our health could be, our score could be. But it's not so many. It's not like millions and millions, right? So our goal is going to be to find out where our points are scored in RAM, because I really want to look cool on the playground uh, and uh, get my points as high as possible, impossibly high, all right? So we're going to do that. Our approach is going to be this. We're going to scan for values in our RAM that increase after we do a certain action, okay? And by only keeping the address locations that are increasing uh, as we collect items, then we can figure out and kind of filter down to find out where our score probably is, all right? And then we're going to use the BGB emulator uh, to do that. So let's go ahead and uh, do this here. I'm going to need to uh, uh, share my screen and not my, um, my window. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. All right, you can, sh you can see my screen now. OK. So we've got BGB. We're going to go ahead and launch that. Uh-oh. What? Oh, no. Did the virus protection? This is an open source emulator. Oh, my goodness. I think I'm getting a. I think I'm getting a bit trolled here. Okay, hold on a second. How do I? Uh, operation not complete. Unwanted software. Uh oh. I think. Uh, I think we might. Uh, can I force it to launch? No. Let me see here. Hmm. Well, that's disappointing. But you know what? We can move on. All right. Let's go ahead and move on. Uh, to my next game we're going to hack, which is much harder to hack, okay? We're going to hack a Street Fighter 4, all right? Super uh, or Ultra Street Fighter 4 is a much more difficult game 
as far as just the number of addresses that you need to filter through. It was released in 2009. It has one gigabyte of RAM, not two kilobytes, and we're going to use Cheat Engine to get this done. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure what antivirus this is. I know it's antivirus that is blocking this, but um, RAV antivirus? That's strange. Okay. Um, let's finish this presentation, then I'll figure it out. All right. Okay. So let's go ahead and run uh, our. Um, let's go ahead and run Street Fighter Four. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, so we've got Street Fighter 4 going on. I'm going to uh, reduce the volume really quickly. Let's see here. There we go. Reduce it a little bit. There we go. Still a little bit loud. There we go. Okay, so we'll get into a fight. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take some damage and review all the address spaces uh, every time we take damage. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into a fight. Okay, we'll uh, race through the cutscenes here. Okay, we've got Hugo. Okay, okay. So we'll pause the game to make sure it doesn't uh, keep going for us and and, uh, and get us in trouble. Um, we'll launch Cheat Engine. Okay, here's Cheat Engine. Here we go. And now what we'll do is we're going to attach to the game process. All right. Here's the process list. And we can come in here and we can find, let me see, where is it? Oh, my gosh. So many processes right now. My goodness. Here it is, Street Fighter 4. So we'll attach to the process. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a scan. We're going to take a look and figure out, okay, what is every value of every address in RAM right now? But we're going to refine the values we care about. So I happen to know that the health values in this game are numbers from 0 to about 1,500. Okay, uh, And 2 bytes is actually enough to hold that value. Uh, and we know it's going to be smaller than about 2,000. So we're going to do a scan and see how many values we get. Okay, We'll do a scan and... All right, we only have 89 million numbers that we have to consider. 89 million numbers, and one of those is going to be our health meter, okay? So what we can do now is we're going to go ahead and take some damage. We're going to need our computer player to help us out here. Take some damage. Oh, not that much damage. Uh oh Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Okay. All right. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to do another scan, but we're going to only keep values that have decreased from their last value, okay? So next scan, we are now down to 175,000. We're down from like 80 million to 100 uh, thousands, okay? We'll take more damage, please. Uh oh, more, more damage, please. The grapple characters are trouble because they do too much damage on every hit. Okay, so let's go ahead and do another decreased value scan. We're down to 6,000 values now. Okay, uh, so now we're going to move back a little bit, and then we are going to keep all the values that have not changed. Okay, so next scan, we're down to 2,000 now. Okay, I need Hugo to like hit us, but not grapple, please. Do not grapple me. Oh, this is brutal. This is absolutely brutal. This is the worst character to fight. We might have to do this again. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and keep all of the values in RAM that have decreased. One of these is our health bar. We're down to 81 values, okay? Oh, boy. I don't know if we should try again. I don't know if we should try again. Okay, let's try one more time. Let's see if we can just get punched. Okay, good, good, good. Good, good, good. All right, we took some damage. Now scan one more time. We're down to 25. So now can we find the values that represent our health? Okay, Chun-Li's health is very low, and we know she's somewhere in the 2,000 to 1,000 range for total. So we're looking at something around 100. I'm looking at these 147s right here and 155s. So 66 seems too low to me. Okay, so we got 147. Um, 
Okay, so what we're gonna do, oh, that's the wrong one. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're going to change these. We can delete this address. Uh, and so let's go ahead and I wanna change their value. I'm gonna change this 147, I'm gonna change it to 999, okay? My, uh, my computer's lagging quite a bit right now. Oh. All right, click the OK button, computer. Hmm. Can I get out of here? No. Uh-oh. Ripperoni. Let's, uh, yeah, this, this worked in a test run. But I think my computer might just be having some, some issues at the moment. Can I hit enter to get that OK button to close? Yeah, it's, it's going to zero, I'm afraid. Um, I think I might have to restart. I think I might have to restart my, uh, my computer, unfortunately. <clears throat> All right. So uh, I'm going to be back in like five minutes, OK? Are we good, team? Yeah, we got gotcha. you. All right. See you in five. Wish me luck. Um, it's uh, manipulating those values is something I'm sort of familiar with the um, the building in debug modes into your games, but I've never actually touched the you know the active RAM of, of a running machine before. <laughs> so that's yeah. it feels fun and adventurous, and I'm not surprised you'd be in a situation where you could you know crash something by setting the wrong value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fun. Um, I used it just recently to uh, hack Plants vs. Zombies. Hmm. Uh, my, my oldest kid started playing that, and I was very happy to, to see him playing that game. Um, and he saw some some YouTuber that was doing you know doing some funny stuff with with Cheat Engine. He's just like, Dad, I wanna I wanna learn to hack this game. <laughs> and I was like, Okay, um, let's uh, let's do some research, you know. <laughs> But uh, yeah, you can do all kinds of fun stuff. What's so fun? I mean, I'm, I, I guess I'm not that like modding is not something that appeals to me that much. Other than I love hearing about it. Like I love this presentation is really getting me going. But I don't ever expect to partake myself. But I look at a tool like that and I'm like, you know what? I could, you could mess up all sorts of programs. It doesn't have to be games, right? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I presume, presumably it's geared more, you know. A little bit better towards games, but just looking at the the tools that were available as as Austin was playing with it, um, it seems relatively general purpose. Um, mm -hmm. Just, I mean, if not for like mucking around, just learning how applications use memory um, would be kind of interesting. Um, you know? Sure. Yeah. I also like the analogy. I mean, uh, going through the the um, game genie as a as a way into this makes a lot of sense because I think. I think a lot of people, like techie folks, kind of know how their computers work. Like they know, you know, whether they've installed their RAM or not. Like they kind of understand. Um, but how consoles worked, how 8-bit computers worked, um, is a little bit of a, a not quite as straightforward. And so hearing it described in essentially the same terms, um, I thought was really helpful. Welcome back, Austin. We'll Hello, team. Here. I have a, I have a breaking update. So in a in a, a, a uh, in an instance of incredible irony. Oh, well, we're not hearing you. Antivirus. Sorry, we we missed the last bit uh, just after irony. Ah, the irony. Um, so uh, when I was installing stuff earlier today, I think I accidentally installed an antivirus tool that I did not want. Uh, and so 
the irony here is that I may have been uh, hacked while trying to hack. <laughs> <laughs> In Somehow other words, I knew that's um, what you were building to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the good news is that I think I've removed it, and I think uh, we should be good to go. Uh, I'll have to move extra fast though. Uh, so let me go ahead and get my stuff set up uh, again, and uh, we'll get my slides loaded. Should be about two more minutes, team. Yeah, no worries. All right, great. So a fun that 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 is a good irony. Just the. The one thing that would stop him is what he, what he ended up putting in front of him. It's, it's great. <laughs> yeah. So, worth the trouble just for the, the gag. I like it. <laughs> if I didn't know better, I'd think it was all scripted. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the Game Genie was... Uh, that, that was my friend when I was a kid. I, I, I got a Game Genie. You know, I read about it in uh, in a magazine somewhere, and I had to uh, mail order it. Oh yeah. Yep, and I spent my you know my own money, my allowance money on it. You know, <laughs> it was like it was like you know buying that thing was like half the price of a Nintendo. That's you know, I I re it's funny uh, that he was talking about the sort of rental market for NES games. Yeah. I I rented the Game Genie fairly frequently. I never <laughs> owned one. But the the code booklet that came with it was really tattered because it you know passed through all sorts of grubby yeah. eight year olds' hands, including mine. And so there'd be pages missing, like from the games <laughs> I wanted to, you know, like how do I get all those? How do I get all the extra pizzas and Ninja Turtles? And you know, <laughs> you just start putting in random numbers, um, and it doesn't help at all because it's, it's like addressing some part of memory that's not relevant. I feel like there was also some good lessons on. On uh, you know game design in the Game Genie too, because it it taught me that if you circumvent all of the the, the difficulty, it's a you know it's it's a, a game ruining event. Right, right. Like the victory is not so sweet. <laughs> yeah. All right, team. We're back in business. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, you're back up. All right. So let's really quickly race through the Carrot Crazy uh, example. So we've got this game. It's a Game Boy Color game. That's going to make our lives pretty easy. Uh, there are a lot of numbers in RAM when you play a Game Boy game. However, however there aren't nearly as many as uh, there are when you play something like Street Fighter, uh, Street Fighter 4. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, get to it. OK, so I want to be the coolest kid on the playground, which means I need to have uh, more points than anyone could possibly actually get Fairly, okay? Um, and by the way, this brings up a quick uh, ethical concern. I say this in jest. Um, you should never use cheats like this uh, to mess with the gameplay of other people. And you should never use this uh, to steal uh, or download illegal copies of games that have been made by others, okay? So please do not uh, like use Cheat Engine when you go online into a multiplayer game. I have no idea what will happen. Uh, it is certainly not very ethical, and you may very well get banned, okay? Okay, so here's the game. We get points by grabbing carrots. I want a lot of points. So we're going to go ahead, and we're going to open up a little option uh, here called Cheat Searcher. Many emulators will have something like this. It essentially allows you to dump RAM at any moment. We're going to go ahead and do that. So here is all the RAM in our game and all the values and addresses available to the game. Um, so let's go ahead, uh, and let's um, let's keep all values which are below the previous value. We're going to grab a carrot, or sorry, above the previous value. We'll grab a carrot, we'll do a search. We're now down from thousands of addresses to just a handful and half a page. We'll grab another carrot, and we'll only keep the values here that have gone up, okay? We're looking for the score. The score went up, so we only keep the values that went up. Now, the score has not gone up, so we're going to keep values that are equal to the previous value, and we're really getting down there now. Let's grab one more carrot and see if we can get this down even further. Okay, we jump to the other side. We grab the value. Again, we only keep values that are larger than the previous value. We now have three, okay, three, three, and 15. The 15 is right here in the UI. We can see that. The threes probably re represent the number of carrots uh, that we have collected. So let's go ahead and change these threes to like 99s, okay? Uh, and we're gonna grab this other one right here, and we're gonna change that three uh, to a 99. We're gonna grab this uh, 15, and we're going to change it to a 99. And 
Uh, let me see. There we go. We now have a 9,900 points, more than I think you can uh, get in this entire stage, and our meters filled up, okay? Um, we can do other stuff. For instance, we can give ourselves infinite lives by finding out where the lives meter is and throwing Bugs Bunny into the, the water. Um, we can even do really fun stuff. Like we can say, hey, friends, like 99 points is really cool, but what about AB points, okay? Because remember, these are hex values which means we can plug in hex. I have heart points, heart heart 100 points. Uh, let's do something a little bit more fun than that, though. Let's do, like, CD, okay? All right, I now have hot dog 1,000 points. So that's kind of kind of neat, isn't it? Um, so that is how you can do that very easily on a kind of an easier-to-hack game. I'm going to give Street Fighter one more shot, so let's go ahead and get it running real quick. I'm going to boot Cheat Engine up. Uh, and uh, there we go. Well, yep, definitely run it. You can say, hey. Okay. And we will go ahead and latch on to the process. We've got we to find it. There it is right there. We've latched on to the process now. We're going to get into a fight as quickly as we can. Let me see here. Da, 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 da. There was Street Fighter 4, and then there was Super Street Fighter 4, and then there was Ultra Street Fighter 4. You know, the developers said that they weren't going to do that. They said they weren't going to do that, but they did. They definitely did. Okay. All right, let's get into it. Okay, we got Guy. All right, good. Okay. Okay, so same plan. Uh, I think Guy will be a lot friendlier to us, though. So let's go ahead. We're looking for two byte values that are smaller than 2,000, okay? Because we know our health is someplace in there. We're going to do a scan. So we're going to scan. We've got like 88 million addresses. No big deal. We're going to go ahead and take some damage now. Help us out. Uh, not enough damage. I want more. It, pro it probably doesn't matter. Okay, good. Good enough. Okay, so now we're going to keep values that have decreased. Okay, so now we're down to 100,000. We're going to take more damage, please. Come on, help, help us out. There we go. Good enough. Now let's go ahead and do it again. Now we're just going to backtrack a little bit, take no damage. Good. And now we're going to keep only the values that have not changed. So keep the unchanged values. Do a scan. Okay. Now we're going to take some damage. Okay, good. We take some damage. So now we're going to do decreased value, new scan. Now we're down to 27 values. Okay. And now I'm going to look through here. Chun Li's health is very high. And I have a, a gut feeling that her health bar at max is around 1,000 or so. I'm really suspicious about these 707s. Okay. Let me see here. Can't be the 317s. That's way too low. And I can't be changing right now. We're in a pause menu. So these 707s are very suspicious. So what we'll do, and I want you to watch the health bar right here, is we're going to go ahead and we're going to change these uh, to 999 values, okay? Uh-oh. Oh, oh no! No, Cheat Engine, say it ain't so. I got this to work just a few moments ago. Oh, brutal. That's really unfortunate, yeah, because this, uh, this is a much cooler demo. Essentially, once we find out where these addresses are, we can actually go into the RAM, uh, the... Um, assembly code itself uh, and we can uh, tell it to uh to uh you know um uh not write to this address anymore and we can we can turn uh some of the operations into no ops and then no one can damage us ever again it's like we created our own cheat code unfortunately though it's not just gonna it's just not gonna happen today and i don't want to eat up any more of your time so unfortunately uh, street fighter hold on does it help at all if we like no it doesn't help at all all right okay so unfortunately, Street Fighter's a bust this time, but at least you got to see the um, the uh, Carrot Crazy example, okay? So let's go ahead and uh, let's go back to the... Nope, that's not the presentation. Let's, uh, let's see if we can... Oh, yeah, no, nope, this is it. Okay. So it's not loading my presentation here. Let me see here. I love technology. All right, good, good, good. So I was presenting this at GDEX, and GDEX decided it wasn't going to have Wi-Fi that year. 
And that uh, is bad news for Google Slides and other web-based slideshows. Um, so one of the cool things that you'll find is as you go out uh, and you explore the various communities, you'll, you'll find that uh, there are communities out there that have done this exact thing. And even for uh, classic games like Super Mario World, they've identified roughly where certain values will be in RAM. Uh, and as a result, you can start to piece together mods, right? You can write scripts that know exactly where to look or can figure out where to look and where to edit values and stuff like that to create uh, mods, to create difficulty modes, stuff like that, cheat codes, okay? I want to talk uh, for a little bit about the value of mods. Uh, so a lot of companies have started to see mods as uh, a, a big benefit, a big feature of their title releases. Uh, Bethesda is fairly well known for that. And while some of the moves they've made are controversial, uh, they certainly do know about and use mods. Um, you know, they've got their uh, Skyrim mods uh, site uh, where you can, I believe, upload your own mods uh, and uh, get them in a, a fairly easy way. Um, there are titles like Gary's Mod, which appear to be pretty much entirely mod, right? Allowing you to take aspects of the source engine and various source files from, from various games. Uh, and, uh, you know, mod how they work and how they are um, uh, kind of uh, arranged uh, with other content, right? can be a, a huge, huge useful thing. Um, there are sites these days, like Nexus Mods, that uh, store uh, interesting modifications for us and help distribute and advertise uh, cool new mods for various games. There are fan game sites that have mods, uh, but uh, also have uh, 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 fan games that are from the ground up. Uh, has anyone heard of um, uh, MFGG? I played uh, a lot of MF MFGG games when I was in uh, like middle school and high school, uh, and a very, very fun time. Um, some mods are meant not just for fun, but to meet you know, um, the needs of consumers uh, that companies aren't uh, interested in, in meeting. Uh, one of the uh, memes in the Smash community is you know, the, they want a, a Melee remake, right? It's a uniquely fast game in the series uh, and very, very fun for professional uh, gaming. Um, however, there's just no HD version unless you know about Dolphin, right? Dolphin and uh, various emulators, uh, assuming you get a legal copy of the game, uh, can add a lot of functionality to that game, uh, can introduce new rendering modes, uh, can get you a crystal clear HD widescreen image of an old school game that really didn't have those things, right? And so that's definitely out there. Uh, a really popular trend in mods these days is the randomizer mod. So this is a GDQ, bit of GDQ footage, a race between two uh, players of A Link to the Past. And what you see in the top here is you see a board of various items that the players have already collected. Now this is a randomizer modification, which means that every chest in the normal game has now had its contents randomized. Now the game is randomized in a very careful way uh, so that uh, the game's always beatable, uh, but you never know what you're going to get. And as a result, the experience can be very different uh, from the traditional original uh, playthrough of the game. It's a ton of fun. It gets a lot of value for, uh, back to the game. Uh, so uh, mods can also be a speedrunning tool. Uh, it wasn't all that long ago that Resident Evil 3 Remake came out and I was watching speedruns and I noticed uh, that uh, there was a lot of cool UI elements, right? Like at the bottom left, uh, there is a mod that uh, puts your keyboard and mouse buttons on the screen. So as you press uh, the keys, your players can kind of see what you're doing. If you look down here in the bottom right, and I think I might, uh, I might be covering it, you can actually see some information about Jill's status, her health, uh, the game time. You can see the difficulty adjustment rank uh, that is normally never told to the player. In this game, uh, the worse you play, the more the game tries to help you out, right? By reducing enemy aggressiveness, by removing enemies, by dropping ammo packs in front of you. But it never reveals to you what that number actually is. And so if you watch, speedrunners will artificially lower that value by shooting into the ground. Because missing a shot causes the DA value to decrease. And so you'll see players just unloading their ammo clips into the ground so that they can get a favorable a difficulty adjustment rating during a certain key moment, okay? So something to consider, because, you know, we, we, we make our own games here, uh, is, you know, how can we think about making our games easier to mod? So the first approach is to do nothing, right? If your game is popular enough, people will eventually um, uh, reverse engineer many aspects of it, and they'll eventually build some sort of scaffolding or framework that makes it easier to build other mods on top of. 
Uh, this is what has happened with Melee. Uh, Melee has a, um, a lot of technologies you can find online uh, that make it easy to manage your modifications, uh, easier to understand what's going on and how to make your own. Um, and uh, Smash Boards is where I believe you can find a lot of this stuff. Another thing that you can do, and this is uh, a little bit easier and, and very much easier for your fans, is you can expose some of your configuration and asset files. Darkest Dungeon does this. If you install the game, what you'll find is um, uh, in your files on your file system, uh, the game puts a lot of art and it puts a lot of configuration files uh, just onto your disk and you can open them. They're human readable. And so if you want to, you can go in to these config files and you can edit the classes and how they work and I believe what their stats are. Uh, and so, you know, that can be a pretty fun thing to go do. And because it's just out there, it, it's exposed, your players will eventually find them and they will eventually start to mess with them and create some fun mods. Okay. Um, another approach that you can do, and this one's kind of fun, is you can expose a scripting language and a scripting system. Okay. The Binding of Isaac Afterbirth Plus uh, did this. I, I believe these were, these games were everywhere. I think they were on DS, they were on Switch, various places. Um, and I went to a talk at GDC, was it PAX or GDC? I went to a talk by Nicholas, um, and uh, they uh, they talked a little bit about their approach there. I believe they used Lua. So if you're using C++ to make your game, right, and Lua to make your game, right, one of these languages is going to be compiled down to very not human readable, very unfriendly, uh, just, uh, you know, a bit code, right? However, stuff like Lua, if your scripts are interpreted, then there's a very good chance you can keep them in a human-readable, easy-to-edit format. And particularly if you expose these onto the disk someplace where your users can get access to them, then they can find these scripts and they can just go to town. They can open it up in any editor they want and they can just start adding functionality. Um, if you have a website uh, like the, the after uh, bodingofisaac.com, uh, then your mods are going to come even faster. Uh, people are going to find your API calls faster. They're going to figure out how to make stuff. You'll be able to, uh, they'll be able to see demos and browse other mods and get documentation, which is super, super nice. Um, uh, but there's a really, really cool world of, of modding out there. And um, if your game is popular enough to have the user base, uh, and if you have the technology to support it, then yeah, you, you can expect some mods to start popping up, okay? Now, if you have to be making a game with Unity, which is my main ecosystem right now, you kind of already have a scripting language. It's C-sharp, okay? Um, and unfortunately, it's not super easy to customize at runtime, and it's not super easy to expose directly to player modders. They can decompile your game if they want to, and that's a way that they could do mods. In fact, um, Yandere Simulator had this happen to them not long, a few years ago. Uh, and in fact, one of my friends uh, actually did this. Um, so uh, he found a way to decompile the game and he found what the scripts look like, right? They have you know, millions, it feels like, uh, variables and does pretty much everything in one function. Um, it is not, let's say, a traditionally structured you know, piece of software. And uh, posted this to the Programming Humor subreddit, and I think that it exploded from there. Um, uh, but the cool thing is, if you have C Sharp as a Unity developer, However, you can actually layer more scripting systems on top of that if you want to, and if you want to make it easier for your players uh, to uh, get access to those scripts. You know, you can use something like Iron Python, which is a Python interpreter that has been built uh, in the .NET framework itself, uh, I believe in C Sharp. Or you can use Lua, something like Moonsharp, uh, which is a Lua interpreter that's been uh, written in C Sharp, uh, and uh, it's, it's really, really fun. All right, I'll show you a little bit about how I use that in just a bit. But essentially, you might load all the files you can from a particular folder. So if a player wants to add more scripts to the game, they can just add more scripts to that folder. They'll be automatically loaded. Okay? There are certain design patterns. I won't go deep into them at all, uh, but design patterns like PubSub uh, that make uh, setting up modding systems easier than usual. Okay? Um, PubSub is when uh, um, you have systems in your game that publish events to kind of a common bus or common stream. Uh, that uh, other systems can listen in on. So if you're writing a mod, you can just listen in for certain types of events and respond by emitting your own events, okay? So something to think about is that modding, what we've talked about so far, requires access to the actual you know, running binary on your machine, 
right? You need to be able to actually run something in RAM to see the assembly code, uh, to see the numbers, okay? And you also need Cheat Engine to work and not freeze up. Um, so hopefully we can make that happen in the future. However, there's a future potentially coming in which the binary blobs aren't running on your machine, right? They are running in a data center and they are beaming the image to you very quickly. And you're simply sending your inputs to that server and then they send you the updated image. <clears throat> and uh, this is something we've seen with uh, Google Stadia. And you know, if, if you happen to be chuckling in your head about Google Stadia and uh, some of their misfortunes, you know, don't, don't do that, they tried, okay? Um, however, um, there are a lot of other services that will be doing this too, and not as a main show-stopping thing. Uh, Microsoft and its xCloud, right? I believe that comes to Game Pass. If it's not there already, it's coming soon. Uh, PlayStation has uh, PlayStation Now. Um, you have various companies uh, that plan on doing stuff with cloud, okay? And as the technology improves, uh, who's to say it won't become the mainstream default cheapest way to, to play games? Um, but anyway, the question is, how do you support modding as a game developer and hacking when your players aren't even going to get access to the executable on their machine, right? Only the images are going. Well, I thought about this, uh, and one thing that could potentially be done is if we made an effort as developers to expose our databases that power our games. Um, and here's an example. Here's a game that I made a while ago. It was a cheap match three game based around like kids meal prep. But don't ask me, right? The, that's what the client wanted. Um, and so what we do in this game is, is kind of interesting. Um, so this game uh, is a match three game. Uh, it loads a lot of its assets uh, from a spreadsheet, a Google spreadsheet online. So here are all the icons in this match three game, right? You got carrots, you got sandwich, you got whatever. Here's the spreadsheet that the game pulls data from. Uh, it is a Google sheet and it has a bunch of different tabs. Uh, and if we go to a particular tab, so grid items, then we actually have all the assets and their score values and their links right in here. What we can do is we can simply add a new item right there. Uh, we can upload uh, a, a new thing, a bagel, let's say, uh, and we can give it a new score. And we do that right here. So we put the link right into that, uh, um, that uh, box right there, and we can see the image is now uploaded, and now we put a score of 5,000 in. Right? So when we replay the game, it reloads, it pulls the new data, and then when we get into an actual gameplay session, we have our donuts, okay? It's in the game. Um, and so the database is in the cloud, the game is in the cloud, and so what you could do here is you could allow your players to go to that database, make a copy of it, and then you could point your game client at that copy of the database, the user's database, instead of the developer's database, the original one. And that is essentially a way of letting users mod the game, despite the fact that it's all in the cloud. Uh, and um, uh, this is something that would almost certainly work uh, via a streaming approach, OK, with something like Stadia or xCloud. Um, anyway, uh, pretty, pretty unique stuff. Um, but that's pretty much all I have to say about this. I'm going to show you one final mod that is perhaps my favorite, uh, and then we are done, OK? And I'll take Q&A if we have any time left. I apologize if we've gone over. So let's take a, let's, uh, let's oh, I need to share, I need to share the uh, window so you'll hear, you'll hear the sound. Here we go. Doesn't that just scream Dark Souls to you? Just mm, perfect match. 
All right, everyone, thank you so much. I actually have one more thing to say. Modifications and hacking may seem like something that is unique to games, but this is not the case. We've been modifying other pieces of art for a long time. You've almost certainly seen this painting before, but maybe you've seen these popular variants of it, right? Uh, we've been modding cool things for a long time, uh, and I hope that uh, if this interests you at all, that you'll give it a shot, okay? There are a lot of fun resources out there. And it's a great way to learn more about the, the wonderful technology uh, that uh, is running you know, right in front of us, right? Get into the guts of it, okay? Um, and again, if you have any questions, uh, you can always reach out to me uh, at, uh, at uh, ayarger at ubitch.edu or austin at arborinteractive.com. You can follow me at yargerdev uh, on Twitter or Arbor Developers for my company. You can revisit this lecture, bit.ly uh, slash modding underscore mdev. And uh, that's, uh, that's all. I'll post these links in the Discord uh, when I'm finished, okay? Thank you all so much uh, for your patience. Uh, this was probably the roughest uh, go we've ever had with this particular lecture. Uh, Cheat Engine has uh, done me a bit dirty, but uh, but we'll have to we'll have to give it another shot another time. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. That was great. You're welcome. We'll give chat a second here to catch up. See if anyone wants to talk about anything. Yeah, my uh, my my YouTube video is is like quite a ways behind me, like 30, 60 seconds. Yeah, I was observing that, yeah. It looks like we have a couple questions. Um, what is your favorite professional memory editor? Um, so I personally don't actually do this kind of work all that often. Uh, my main job is making games uh, and uh, lecturing about them. Uh, but when I, I hack a little bit, I, uh, I use an editor called HXD. Uh, which, for my purposes, has been perfectly fine. I believe it's uh, free. And I think it's open source. Um, so uh, you should be able to, to Google. You're welcome, everyone. You're welcome. All right. Well, I guess we should uh, make the transition uh, here. Um, yeah, so the, the chat is talking about how Iron Python and Moon script, Moon, uh, Moon Sharp are slow. I found that to be kind of the case as well. The problem with Moon Sharp is actually pretty fast. Um, the problem is it has some garbage collection uh, costs that are really bad. It doesn't implement object pooling the way it could. And I've been wanting to go in and fix that up because it is an open source project and I think it would be incredible for to, to have just better pooling. Um, let me see here. Any other questions? I don't... What do you see? Any? Just scrolling back through to see if there's anything interesting to bring up, but I don't see... Not seeing many questions. All right. Well, thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, I don't know if I mentioned this uh, earlier, but uh, uh, Austin very kindly uh, volunteered to fill in for this spot uh, just earlier today. So uh, <laughs> that was really great. I'm glad you're able to come. Uh I, no problem. Um, I will say one thing, uh, one uh, little uh, shameless plug. Um, I'm working on a survival horror game. Uh, you can find it on itch.io. Uh, if you like old school, like Resident Evil style survival horror, uh, then give it a give it a look. It's based on a college campus, and it is a little bit spooky. Okay, uh, I'll post the link to that as well in just a few moments. All right, yeah, take care, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye. All right. All right, so um, I don't know if we normally do a, a little pause here or if we just launch into the next one, but um, if, if Ben is ready, I think we could just go. Yeah, we usually do. We've been testing different intermission formats, but I think yeah. if Ben's ready, um, we'll give him the 30 seconds uh, of uh, lag so he knows we're ready for him. Um, we can just go right into it. Okay.
Hello, Ben. Welcome. Oh. How are you? Good. Oh, good. Glad to hear it. <laughs> Hope everybody can hear me okay. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, yeah, welcome to the stream. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself, and uh, you can... Sure, sure. Screen if you've got, uh, got slides or whatever you want to show off. Yeah, I do have slides. Oh, yeah. I can do it real quick. Um, I'm kind of watching YouTube, make sure everything's going well there too. But um, I just have uh, a quick little talk about things that I've discovered with uh, running uh, both game jams as well as um, some just collaborative music endeavors. Um, I didn't know if there's any other housekeeping you guys need to do before I start talking or if I'm good to go. Just let me know. No, we're, uh, yeah, we're ready for you. All right. Awesome. So um, I decided to call this Game Jams to connect artists. Um, I feel that Game Jams are, are a wonderful tool for personal development. Um, but I, I, I can actually share my uh, camera, too. That always helps. There we go. Um, game jams are a great tool for personal development, but it's also a wonderful way to bring people together. Um, I'll give the quick intro out of the way. My name is Ben Burns. I go pretty much everywhere online as Ben underscore Burns. Um, primarily, I am a musician and a developer, and I have hosted a music challenge for the last four, four and a half years now, and I just started hosting uh, game jams every quarter. Um, and that's kind of what inspired this whole thing. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk about the OST Jam, which is the game jam that I run. Essentially, um, I help uh, the musicians, my, mus my friends and uh, my community, who is primarily musicians. I do a quarterly music challenge. And then that kind of all collects together into a uh, bundle of music. And then that music is used to inspire game developers in a game jam. And this was something that we talked about for a long time. This is the two hour album challenge, which is where the music comes from. Um, we, we had talked about this because we have a listening party at the end of these music challenges. And there was an overwhelming response with people being like, oh man, I could totally hear this in a video game. This, this could totally fit into this other into this other project that I'm working on and, and all of this feedback. And I really didn't want that opportunity to go to waste, which is um, why we started the OST Jam last year. And it kind of basically, um, the, the two hour album challenge ends and then the following Wednesday, uh, we start the, um, the OST Jam. Um, so that gives me a little bit of a buffer in between to actually uh, like set up the files and make sure everybody has like is properly attributed inside the inside the um, project. Um, but this is all managed on itch. This was something that I really wanted to do, but um, the the process of collating all this music was was so difficult. I didn't want to manually run the game myself as well um, because that seems like a lot of work. Um, but. Yeah, so this is completely opt-in by the artists. Um, usually about 80% of the people who participate in the album challenge also opt their music into this game jam, which is incredible. Like I was expecting maybe 50% or 30% of people to, to want to be a part of this, but there was just an overwhelming support for this. And um, I had a ton of fun putting it together because of that, because it was a lot less work for me. I could actually sit down and work on a game rather than managing the jam itself. Um, and I wanted to just show a, a couple of the different types of games that we've made so far. Again, this has been going on for about a year now that we're, uh, we just started volume five of this and I'll post a, a link to the itch um, jam in chat. But the first one and, and the main kind of game that we get are kind of like little bullet hell games or games that are revolving around um, like rhythm games in some way. Uh, and this this is just a, a fun, like really kind of aesthetic uh, design for a game. You can see that there's like a progress bar for the music on the top. And I, this this might have been hard coded or it might have been procedural based off of just the, the input music. Um, this is another kind of rhythm game. I really like this game. Um, this is a platformer game, but the the platformer, the character only jumps 
when the music is playing or or on particular beats in the music. So you had to not only um, navigate correctly, but you also had to jump correctly and listen to the music and kind of know the rhythm of the game. And that's when you had to jump. And if you ran out of time with the song, you had to restart that section. I, I thought this was an incredibly creative and, and really cool um, execution of this. Um, this is like a more chill game. Uh, this is essentially kind of a mix between like Papers, Please and like a jukebox. So you see people walking outside and they had particular moods that they wanted to hear. And if you played those moods on the jukebox, you would bring people in and you would um, essentially kind of grow your score that way. I thought that this was a really cool implementation of just an, uh, a way to not only showcase all the music, but create an interactive element with it to to bring, um, to kind of just marry those, those two things. It's not just about music and it's not just about games, it's about everything. And then um, we just have fun, interesting games where people are inspired by the music. And this was the original intent by this, where um, somebody heard a particular song and they're just like, oh man, that would be cool with this idea that's been like bubbling in my head. And um, it, it just kind of brings all of this together into a cohesive um, into a cohesive thing. Yeah, this is, um, I think it's like the, the art, the tortoise and the hare parable except the the hair has like laser cannons and are trying to destroy the tortoises before they cross the finish line i thought this was really cool um but i wanted to talk that we always make sure that we properly attribute the um the artists we want to make sure that everybody gets their credit for this and it's not just about making sure that the artist or the musician has their name on the game jam page but it's also a way to connect artists and like the whole goal that i had for this was to bring people together um the this cross-pollinating fan bases is is very very important when it comes to being a small artist both as a musician or a visual artist or a graphic designer or a game developer like everybody Everybody just needs that cross-pollination because um, it's collaboration is kind of the lifeblood of how we grow our audience these days. And it's something that is so very, very valuable. And it's very hard to do organically. Um, but these types of... Um, oops, I thought I had more on the next slide. These, these types of, of uh, collaborative events really help not only bring people together, but help share the work that these people do to a broader audience. And I think that it's it's incredibly powerful for that. And another thing that I really like about this jam uh, compared to some of the other jams that are out there is that it's not about complete, it's not about winning the jam. Um, we have a very wide open uh, space for this jam to happen because everybody's schedule is different, especially these days where either health issues can pop up or anything can happen, you know? And it's like having a two week window to realize an idea seems a way better way to, to handle um, this type of project rather than being, and I, I love Ludum Dare. I, I've participated in it a couple times. But I, I I really like the the more chill approach to to handling this kind of stuff, um, and it's the same thing with the two hour album challenge as well. Um, you have a whole weekend to write a song, but the the challenge is to write that song within like a two hour window. Um, but I didn't want to limit the um, the the two hour window to just like you have to do this between six and eight o'clock p.m. on Saturday or something because people wouldn't be able to participate then. But if you open up that window, that time window to something much larger, you can bring more people in. And again, that allows for more, far more cross-pollination and it brings a lot more people together. And I think that that's very important, especially if you're if you're a newer game developer, like just putting something out into the world and releasing something on itch is a huge win. You, you don't have to worry about voting or any of that other stuff. And that's that's something that I've found both from running the music challenge as well as running this game jam challenge, it's more important to just allow people to participate and and get that experience of releasing something moreover than like trying to choose a winner at the end of it. 
Um, and then everybody gets a unique experience from this. Uh, it gives people an opportunity to not only try something that might be outside of their wheelhouse, but also work with um, other people. There have been a lot of people that have never worked collaboratively before. And um, it's so important to have that skill set to be able to communicate what you want out of um, a project. And a lot of the uh, musicians have uh, included their contact information. So if a developer needs uh, stems or like maybe just like the drum layer of a song, they can reach out and maybe work with that person collaboratively and, and put something together that's truly unique. And I think that it's just really important to have that um, ability to just bring people together in that way and, and, and provide that unique experience because it does offer validation, inspiration, um, and just the ability for a musician to hear their music in uh, interactive art, like a game, but it also gives um, the game developers a chance to try something unique with music that's really never been used in another project before. There's there's a ton of stock music out there, and, and that stuff is awesome, but it also can be a little stale sometimes, and, and having, having a, a type of, uh, having music that's completely unique and you can actually reach out and talk to the artist directly. I think that that just creates a, a positive feedback loop for everybody involved because it's you're all encouraging each other to try new things and try harder and and just grow together. And I think that that's that's very interesting and valuable. And finally, it's just really important to connect artists together. Um, as a musician, I've made music for video games as well as small or like short films and stuff, but everything is about connections. Every job I've ever gotten has been from knowing somebody else. Um, I've tried doing cold emails before, tried doing cold calls, all of this stuff. And the best way that I've found to, to get future work as both a developer and a musician is to know people who are learning and growing. And eventually, if they stick with it, they'll also grow into needing commissioned music in some point in the future. There's, there's, I've had plenty of jobs that have come about simply because uh, somebody used my free, the, the music that I offer for free, and then they get to a point where they want to commission something because they're making like their first real game or something like that. And it's it's just really important to grow that connection, that, that network of people that you know. And these game jams give people the opportunity to do that. And that's that's really powerful. Um just for all of the um sorry, you were waving your hand there. I didn't know if that was at me or not. <laughs> um it was just really powerful to connect everybody together. And I, I think that it's 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 so important to do that, especially early on as an artist. Um, and this started as a music jam and it's kind of evolved into a game jam after that, but who knows where it could go from there. It could turn into a concept art, art jam. Like the, the results from the game jam can turn into something where people write a story inspired by a game or make concept art, art inspired by the story inspired by the game. And this could be an entire like circular process. And I think that it's really cool that you could almost play a game of telephone where you start with one piece of art and it gets translated into another piece of art and then it gets translated into another piece of art and it just keeps moving forward and forward and forward. And it can kind of build this um, lore and, and story and just like this rich backstory from it, just from everybody kind of just doing their own thing with um, this original piece of work. And I think that there's there's a lot of really cool opportunities in the future from like taking art from one person and then collaborating with other people and then just like this entity that keeps moving from group to group and just um, just keeps getting ins inspired by other people. Um, so I kind of sped run through this cause I know we were having technical difficulties before, but I wanted to really kind of talk about the overview because this is like really important to me. This has become, come something that I've, um, it's kind of integrated into my just creative process now where every three months I do the music thing. I do a game jam after that, and I'm trying to, trying to bring everything together. So I know that we have a bit of a delay on the YouTube stream 
So uh, if anybody has questions about this, feel free to ask. I will drop the link to the OST jam in the YouTube chat. I forgot to add that into my um, my thing, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, a story game jam except with art. Um, so the game jam actually started today. Yeah, it started today. Um, the the OST jam uh, started today with I think 48 songs in the OST. Um, the the um, two hour album challenge uh, ended last weekend uh, with 60 submissions and most people brought it into the OST jam and that's uh, pretty much it. I'm very excited about this and I and I just kind of really want to spread the reach not only of the concept or not only of the OST jam, but the concept of collaborative game jams like this, where it's not about just um, having a, a particular challenge with a theme, but working with other people's art and, and trying to bring people together into a community through that. Um, yeah. So if anybody has questions, I'll be in chat. Uh, otherwise, uh, that's uh, it for me. So I'll stop. I'll Very stop cool. My... Yeah, thank you. How do I stop oh, that's my screen share? <laughs> I can tell you one thing for sure. Uh, there are a few things that make uh, game jammers more happy than when uh, you can uh, bring some music into it, because a lot of them, yeah, don't. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and and th that's another thing from my experience as a musician, um, where it's it's difficult to find music in a game jam environment sometimes. Um, just because either limitations of the jam where you have to create everything yourself, like literally everything, some of the, like the, the solo Ludum Dare thing has that. But sometimes um, you just want to find something very specific to the, the project that you're working on and you can't find it. And I, I kind of like the idea of flipping the script on this where the game is inspired by the music rather than the other way around. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, it's always yeah. interesting to get get inspiration from different places yeah absolutely so yeah that's that's all that i had thank you uh so much for having me yeah i'm so glad you that you were able to join us yeah yeah and this does happen every three months so um you, you can always sign up for this one or just kind of search ost jam and i don't have an official website for this yet but i uh i'm working on that i've had a lot of uh a lot of stuff going on okay well maybe i'll i'll, I'll uh might have to fire up fruity loops and give it a go yeah <laughs> cool all right well let's double check uh let's double check chat see if anyone's got uh david i have to speak for the crowd and we need to know what's going on with that cupboard <laughs> <laughs> ah, all right all right all right well, it was open before, and then I saw comments about it, so I was just like, oh, now I'll close it. And then, but it's just, uh, yeah, I think, who said, yeah, Marty. Marty called it right. It's just it's just 3D printing filament. And so whenever I'm printing stuff, I'm all, I always... That's all there is to it. That's, that's why it's open. It's because I'm messing with it. That's it. That's you, the whole story. I mean, you missed an opportunity to come up with a really great, you know, uh, spin a yarn, or perhaps spin a, you know, some filament of a of a tale of nonsense and <laughs> hidden treasure. But uh, but I, I I admire your ability to give uh, people exactly what they asked for. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that is our meeting. That's all we got planned. Yep. A uh, reminder about um, Global Game Jam, ggj.igdatc.org. All those letters will get you to the uh, um, Global Game Jam uh, site page where you can sign up. Uh, we'll put that in chat as well. And I don't know, anything else we need to do? Quick reminders of you can always go back and watch the intro. It's got all the details. Uh, yeah, if people want to hang out after the meeting here, um, they can come to the what the Twin Cities Game Dev Discord channel. Yes, I forgot all about that, but of course we do hang out after the fact. Uh, in the Minneapolis room or the St. Paul room, the voice chat channels, um, if you're not already on the Discord, 
discord.igda.org will get you the invite, and it'll uh, you can pop right in and say hello. All right. With that, thanks for tuning in, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time.